well. Uh, I, I still do drugs and I'm not addicted, so that just goes um, to show you. Done right, drugs are wonderful. <laughs> like a good drink every now and then. Welcome, ladies. Have a seat. Lydia, two people who were at the Cabaret Sauvage ah, enjoyed the dancing. Well, maybe fantastic. They enjoyed the text. Well, how did you taste? Huh, the text was good that night. <laughs> Yeah. Just let it run. It's not, it's not, you know, it costs nothing on the video. You can edit it later or not. Of course, now I've run out of all my jokes. You can burn it later. Oh, and no post way. it only if I tell you you can. Yeah, whatever. I want to see the picture of the eight-year-old who I'm not going on. Oh, I'm already on it. Okay, boss, I'll go get it. I need my computer for that. That's all right. This is what we do for money in my world. I love it. So you're here to go to business school, or what exactly are you here? I should maybe, no, I'm not here in business school. I work in American studies and American literature. Oh, you work in American literature. Do they have that here? Yeah, they do. Oh, well, good. That's probably you know, I guess. We don't have someone at the door. Hello? Hi. Hello. <laughs> this is our technique. We personally greet every person. Yeah, exactly. Okay. Welcome. Feel right at home. That is if your home is an opium den in ten years. <laughs> and you're drunk. <laughs> oh, that's great then. I didn't even do, know that they did literature here. I just come here to, you know, spew vitriol. Oh, I'm not in the University of Chicago. I'm across the street at uh, Paris University. Ah, oh, Paris University. It's not the same way you go to the University of Chicago. It is. Uh, you know, I, I am trying to also extort them okay. for a good amount of money for a conference in March. So that should be. I come. I, oh yeah, yeah, yeah. I've already been planting the seeds. So yeah, I mean, I, I love to extract money from universities. Now you, you should. That's basically. You know, I, I, at university. Well, I dropped out in the tenth grade, and I feel who better to talk to university students than someone who is educated in the school of hard knocks than you. So, but that's it. Oh, I agree. Thank you. Always you be. <laughs> no, they're look. I, the police is great. Um, so what? What? What area of American literature? Oh, that's a bad picture of me. Give me the other one. Oh, that's uh, a good one. That's the one. Oh. I mean, he was bold enough to get on stage while I was singing a suicide song, right? That's good. All right, all right. Welcome. Yes, it's not starting yet. We're just warming up the crowd. <laughs> Of uh, what what period of American literature? Oh, I love the new generation. Like, oh, okay. Okay, okay, I'm about to insult her. That's very good. He should be insulted. Yesterday, a friend texted him that she wasn't so happy that he tortured a cat in one of his books. I guess junkie. Yeah, well, I mean, I've been accused of torturing a cat too. I mean, and he killed his wife. One of my husbands committed suicide, so I mean, we're kind of on the same page. No, I see. Yeah, uh, I'm gonna, I want to talk about the differences and the comparative similarities because um, I never read. I was never. I was very into Burroughs as an icon and as a thinker, essayist, yeah. and as a lifestylist. We have to talk about this more people later. But the Beat Generation, their their lifestyle was very effective to me. But the literature post Beat, Selby Miller, that was really impacting to me as a writer. But I, I'm going to compare some of Burroughs' uh, troubles with mine. Yeah, I'm have some reads. <laughs>
next year, but I'm mad. Yeah, I can roll this later. <laughs> We'll be starting soon. We're just waiting for a certain professor to arrive. Not really. Cummings from the time we can't have those. He's in Singapore. We should have set, we should do this on Skype for him. You can see him flinch. Any questions before we begin? <laughs> Usually I ask the audience if they don't ask me anything, so you might want to think of something quick. Yeah. My introduction is going to be lousy, so you know, <laughs> it's always like that. We're going to wait a few more minutes and then close the door, and then you're in here until I finish. So if you have to go to the bathroom, maybe you should come out. It's not going to take that long, but you might have to run. <laughs> so nice to be in front of an American audience, you poor people. Isn't it nice to be out of America for a while? Do you feel, I mean, I know you just got here, but do you feel it? Looking at you. <laughs> as you look happy. Why are you happy? Because you're from Paris? Yeah. Oh, Where are you from? I'm from Chicago. You must be real happy. Oh, I'm it's, not it sucks there now, doesn't it? It's pretty dry. It's pretty dire. Is everybody from Chicago who goes to school here? Or not? No. 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 Just call out where you're from. San Diego. Nashville, Dallas. Pennsylvania. From where in Pennsylvania? Nashville. Interesting. I lived in Pittsburgh for four years. I loved it. Yeah. Anywhere else? Los Angeles. Los Angeles? And you go to school here? Uh, yes. Like it? Or did you just get here? Um, well, I just got here, but I've been at University of Chicago for a minute. Oh, okay. Mm -hmm. <laughs> it's a good break from America. I mean, the French are kind of fucked up as well, but America's really in bad shape. It's really bad. It's mm -hmm. pathetic, actually. It is the terrorist. Our kids are the mother's speech. This is why America is terrorist. Uh, America is the terrorist. I left America on, after when Bush stole the second election. I live in Barcelona. As an artist, I can't support myself in America. I never could. I could only always support myself in Europe, like a lot of artists historically. Um, not that I don't perform in America, but uh, as you know from having lived there, a lot of people are fucking stupid. All right, and the culture is grotesque, and basically it is the pop pornification of everything, meaning we'll show you every kind of violence and sex, but we won't tell you anything about it, so the understanding is minimal. The one thing about the French is they really understand sex and death, and drugs, and rock and roll, and it's a really good place for that. And truly it is. They get it. They get literature. They get music. They get death. I, a lot of suicide here. I'm not promoting that. I'm just saying it is an option if things suck too bad. It should be your option to commit suicide. Um, killing is another issue. See, as Americans, we think that we can just go around the planet killing every fucking buddy and get away with it, and we do. And you wonder why I'm homicidal. Well, I'm an American, goddammit. Yeah, that's just uh, how I feel. Welcome to France, kids. Oh, uh-huh. Uh -oh. He must have snuck in. Very good. I think we can begin. I think we should begin. We can shut the door. You arrive, so we're going to begin. Oh, come on, don't be shy. Right in. Yes, ladies, welcome. You might want to see if there's any, like, ghosts stalking us. Yeah, there's any extra chairs. Well, do I really need to make an introduction after what you just said? Um, yes, you do. Okay. I can say anything. Okay. I just well, I'm didn't tattering on and on. I didn't hear anything. Well, why should you? You know everything about me. Yeah, that's right. <laughs> Let me give Sebastian an introduction for those of you who don't know him. I think we're going to start there. This guy, is this my fifth time here? I'll be back. Um, that's a moth. It's going to, yes. Catch him. You can kill it. It's only a moth. I saw Sebastian Greppin lurking at a few of my performances. I'm a, I'm a performance artist. Uh, some people call me that. I call myself a confrontationalist and a hysterian. And I went up to him because he was nervous. And usually, I, when I see people that are nervous, I do go up to them. Uh, I've been nervous once in my life. I figured I cause panic. I shouldn't have panic. So when I see somebody who's nervous, I go up to them because I don't want them to be in panic if they're at my show. I figure if they're coming to see me, they're coming to relieve their frustration or their hatred or their panic. And what's bizarre is some of the softest, most sensitive, shy people are very attracted to are very attracted to me. 
and I want them to be because I, I understand horror, <laughs> being horrific myself. So I asked Sebastian, who are you and why are you at my show again? And he said, well, I'm Sebastian. And I'm like, well, what do you do? And he said, I work at the University of Chicago Bears. And I'm like, well, where's my date? Give me a show. And he did. And then he just kept giving them to me. So I love Sebastian. It's because of him I'm here. And he's very helpful and very, he, he assists me a lot. He takes me to many of my shows. He tolerates my humor. I'm vulgar. He isn't. He laughs at all my crudity. I don't know what he finds of interest in me, but he's going to tell you right now. Sebastian. How did you come to me, my friend? Well, it started when I was 17 years old. You were a bit old. That's all right. Usually it's 14 when people come to me. I prefer it that way. I think all 14-year-olds should come to me. <laughs> um, I don't know exactly what happened. It was like love at first sight, I think. Not at first sound. No, he said sound. that. <laughs> yeah, right. Um, my name is Lydia Lunch. Oh, yeah, by the way, this is Lydia Lunch. <laughs> I'm really happy to have you here, Lydia. Oh, thank you, Sebastian. My pleasure. Be here. It was really unexpected. <laughs> um, I force you as often as I can to pay me. Thanks. Thanks for, <laughs> thanks for coming over. No problem. <coughs> Always a pleasure to have you. Well, it's as Lydia said, it's her fourth visit, but every time something different happens. Um, Lydia, what we did? We did stuff on No Wave. We did. You, you know, nah, you're not gonna get it. It'll probably come to me because it likes me. How do you think I got all these holes? <laughs> My own off um, factory. But, I mean, it doesn't really matter why I like Lydia or not. I think what's really... <laughs> yes, it does. I think it's... I want just to say that Lydia... Lydia has been around for a very long time. Thanks. I, I look it. I know. <laughs> Actually, I've been, she performing, doesn't. I've been performing since 1977. I'm old right. enough to be your lover. <laughs> it's true. Since her first band in New York, Chinese Jesus and the Church. I've been performing for 36 years. I know it's hard to believe that I've also been 35. <laughs> and, um, but tonight I think we're going to be, well, Lydia has done everything possible uh, in the arts. <laughs> you didn't have to add the arts, honey. I've done everything possible. That's right. Well, I was quite Carry on. Sorry. Be a bit more like on the arts tonight. Sure, Pat. We, we can talk about the rest later. We will. But that's reading. We're going to talk about all of the rest. <laughs> fuck art. Let's fuck. I didn't say that. I just copied oh, somebody on it. I'm going to get fired again. Stop. I'll have your job. Okay. <laughs> and then I'll invite you to talk about me. <laughs> Go on, Sebastian. It's going to be pretty boring. You're trying to re you're trying to tell these kids who might never who don't really know why they're here what it's all about. Yeah. Well, I I just want to say that you were a singer. You're a performer. You're an, I think you're an artist. I'd like to correct you on those fronts. First of all, I do sing. I am not a singer. Oh, I do right. perform, but that's every minute of my life. Artist, I refuse that term because I think it's too precious. I consider myself um, the no wave Nostradamus. I consider myself channeling the ancient arts in the oral tradition a hysterian of our times, of history, of my history, and a journalist. So no matter what format my art takes, and I had no choice but to do what I do, and uh, so art seems like something people might choose to do. Uh, if I didn't do what I do, which first and foremost has to do with words, and has to do with communication, and has to do with talking about the universal traumas we all know and some of us experience, uh, I would probably be dead or in prison because I am criminal by nature. I am violent by nature. I am an American, but my violence has many ventricles in which to voice itself. Therefore, I've never even thrown a plate in anger at anybody. I'm far more manipulative than that. You were saying? Oh, no. Um, I, I was saying that um, tonight, uh, we were going to be, you were going to be talking more specifically about William Burroughs, um, which I, I will let you introduce the man. Yeah. I, I, I just decided to come with one of my records. A rare, a rare record, actually. From my collection. About when? In 1984. 1984, 30 years Perfect. ago. Perfect, 1984. And here you see... The young lunch. You see the young lunch. The young Muppet-topped lunch. You see the old Burroughs. Master, that he was. John Giorno, Jim Carroll. Yes. 
John Giorno is an American poet who is, has the Giorno poetry systems and has released many records of poets with many different <coughs> poets. He is 76 years old and smokes 16 marijuana joints a day. He is miraculous. I smoke one hit, I need to lie down. He's amazing. Yeah. Jim Carroll died of a heroin, no, he, he was a heroin addict, but he just died very young. Of course, Burroughs was a lifetime heroin addict and died at the age of 84. Who else is on there? David Johansson? David Johansson was uh, in the group The New York Dolls, and actually The New York Dolls is the reason I ran away to New York at the age of 14. That's just who's on that record, except right. people. So just to say that you haven't discovered Burroughs yesterday night, you decided to talk about No, it. but I was still writing my intro to him uh, 10 minutes ago, so. That's right. Well, it took you 30 years to write it, and you finally did exactly. it. Well, I had to wait for him to die. That's right. So uh, I'm not going <coughs> to bore people. I told you my introduction was going to be lousy. Um, I'll, fill, I'll fill people in. Thank you. I'm a confrontational performance artist by some people's standards that began to be music in 1976 in New York City. My first group was called Teenage Jesus and the Jerks. I'm basically a musical schizophrenic, which means that every phase of my music, which is always based on words, the music is always changing, so I'm inventing new genres or attempting to invent new genres by um, taking old ones and updating them. I've worked with many people from Henry Rollins to Sonic Youth to Nick Cave to Hubert Selby to Jerry Stahl, Karen Finley, Wanda Coleman, uh, different people in both poetry and music. Um, I've lived in many places, uh, and I want to talk a little about what the similarities and the differences between William Burroughs and I are. Now, Burroughs did not influence me as a writer at all. By the age of 12, I was already writing. Uh, I had already written, uh, I had already read Hubert Selby Jr., who wrote Last Exit to Brooklyn, one of the most important American novels, and Requiem for a Dream, and a few other books. Uh, Henry Miller, who came to Paris in the 40s because he couldn't stand America and had to survive by selling pornography on $2 a day. Uh, Jean Genet was very influential to me. Uh, Michel Foucault was very influential. And the Marquis de Sade, many French people, very influential to me because basically they were all insane or homosexual or sex addicts or alcoholics and junkies and wrote really great stuff. Um, the writers that influenced me were writers that told basically the truth about their life. I'm not interested in fiction. I don't write fiction. I don't read fiction. And when I was reading, for instance, Henry Miller, although it may seem it's fictionalized, these are real stories about his life. Same with Hubert Selby. What I held as prejudice against Burroughs, and, and in some ways, the Beat Generation was, was impacting to me, although I'm not part, I was, I was condemned as being an offshoot of the Beat Generation, but when I heard the word Beat Generation, I really thought it was a physical attack against the audience, which suited me just fine. The Beat Generation, what they imparted upon me, is that they were nomadic travelers who wrote about their experiences. So Jack Kerouac, of course, and, and William Burroughs, and uh, Ellen Ginsberg. What was impacting to me about William Burroughs is not so much his writing, because he let, wrote a lot of books that I really didn't fucking like at all. As a matter of fact, I think most of them suck. I think that Junkie is a good book, but the problem with Junkie is it's really based on another writer called Hubert Hunky, who wrote a book called Guilty of Everything. Um, what impressed me about the Beats is just that they lived their life from place to place and were outlandish and eventually got published. What was interesting about Burroughs, besides the writing, is the iconography that he represented. He looked like a CIA agent. I was always suspicious of him anyway. He was, he was a trust fund baby, so he was supported by his parents as he moved around from city to city, country to country as a heroin addict, which we should all be so lucky as to be supported as addicts by our parents. This is 1940s and 50s. He shot his uh, second wife to death and got away with it on a suspended sentence in Mexico. That's pretty impressive to me. One of my ex-husbands committed suicide and murder, that, another parallel. I didn't have to kill him, he killed himself, thank you very much. I don't think they'd be kind to me as if, I went, if I went to prison on that. Um, Burroughs was a bit of a prophet because, especially in like Naked Lunch, which is what I'm gonna be reading some extracts from, he kind of predicted the AIDS epidemic, crack epidemic, um, autoerotic fantasies and fatalities, and he really understood the conspiracy, many conspiracies that the American government were waging against the individual people. 
He was one of the first people to talk about the drug ayahuasca, which is very popular now. Well, there's a lot of writings about it. And basically, ayahuasca is a South American drug that, you know, shaman, the first shaman, you know, shamanistic. It's used to uh, treat and reparate, actually, the, the human psyche. I mean, it's considered a memory theater drug. And it's like Ibogaine, another drug that's from Africa, can really help to cure addiction because it re ups the dopamine. Of course, the American government wants to keep this suppressed and people still have to find this on the down low. But Burroughs was investigating ayahuasca in uh, the 50s and 60s. So Ellen Ginsberg and Jack Kerouac and, and Burroughs were kind of the unholy trinity of the beat generation. And this is in 1943. And that to me is, is really amazing that if you consider it's 1943. This is not long after the prohibition. I don't even know, maybe prohibition was still on then. Um, and there's these three wacky counterculture weirdos getting together to write poetry and encourage each other and to do drugs. and. Burroughs was one of the first people, along with, with Ginsburg and Kerouac, that openly talked about being queer, using the term queer, um, drug taking, and, uh, and, and nomadic. And they broke a lot of ground with that because a lot of the material, especially Burroughs, he had a hard time getting published, obviously, we're talking the 50s. And it was somebody at the University, uh, it was the Chicago Review, for, financed by the University of Chicago, that actually published some of Naked Lunch first. And Grove Press, which is a very good publishing house, I don't know if it still exists, out of America, that stood up a lot for the, uh, against censorship, defending Hubert Selby and defending Burroughs ultimately, and this was in the 60s, made it possible for people like me to carry on to publish, and actually Grove Press published my first book of poetry, which was written with uh, Exene Cervenka of the Group X, Cult Adulterers Anonymous. So, those are some of the parallels between William Burroughs and myself. And I'm now gonna, his, his, what he, uh, with, with Brian Geisen, a painter and another writer, uh, they developed the cut up technique, which was basically very controversial and radical at the time as well, because was, the literature was so linear. It was like you write a novel, it was the beginning, the middle, the end, like movies were. But they decided to just cut a bunch of shit up, throw it together and see what happens. And it makes for some very interesting and really some ab just abominable writing. You have to take from it what you will. And a lot of authors have then taken from this, this technique. Well, what I'm doing here tonight is, is I like to call the cut-in technique, which is I'm going to read a few Burroughs passages, and then I'm going to read some of mine that relate kind of in a sense to that. So with no further ado, let's hear a little William Burroughs, shall we? Thank you. My name is Lydia Lodge. This is fine. Oh, thank you. Thank you. And uh, all of this would be from William Burroughs' Naked Lunch, The Restored Tax. The Rube. The Rube is a social liability with his attacks, as he calls them. The mark inside was coming up on him, and that's a rumble nobody can cool. Outside Philly, he jumps out to con a prowl car, and the fuzz takes one look at his face and busts us all. 72 hours and five sick junkies in the cell with us. Now, not wishing to break out my stash in front of these hungry coolies, it takes maneuvering and laying of gold on the turnkey before we are in separate cells. Provident junkies, known as squirrels, keep stashes against a bust. Every time I take a shot, I let a few drops fall into my vest pocket. The lining is stiff with stuff. I had a plastic dropper in my shoe and a safety pin stuck in my belt. You know how this pin and dropper routine is put down. She seized a safety pin caked with blood and rust, gouged a great hole in her leg which seemed to hang open like an obscene festering mouth waiting for unspeakable congress with the dropper which she now plunged out of sight into the gaping wound. But her hideous, galvanized need, hunger of insects in dry places, has broken the dropper off deep in the flesh of her ravaged thigh, looking rather like a poster on soil erosion. But what does she care? She does not even bother to remove the splintered glass, looking down at her bloody haunch with the cold blank eyes of a meat trader. What does she care for, for the atom bomb, the bed bugs, the cancer rent, friendly finance, waiting to repossess her delinquent flesh? Sweet dreams. 
The real scene, you pinch up some leg flesh and make a quick stab hole with a pin. Then fit the dropper over, not in the hole, and feed the solution slow and careful so it doesn't squirt out the sides. When I grabbed the rube's thigh, the flesh came up like wax and stayed there, and a slow drop of pus oozed out the hole, and I never touched a living body cold as the rube there in Philly. I decided to lop him off if it meant a smother party. This is a rural English custom designed to eliminate aged and bedfast dependents. A family so afflicted throws a smother party where the guests pile mattresses on the old liability, climb up on top of the mattress, and lush themselves out. The rube is a drag on the industry and should be let out to the skid rows of the world. There is an African practice, officially known as the leader out, as the function of taking out old characters into the jungle and leaving them there. The rube's attack become a habitual condition, cops, doorman, dog, secretary, snarl at his approach. The blonde god has fallen to untouchable vileness. Con men don't change, they break, shatter, explosions of matter and cold interstellar space, drift away in cosmic dust, leave the empty body behind it, hustlers of the world, there is one mark you cannot beat, the mark inside. I say, you can't save anyone from themselves. You will lose everything by attempting to play savior. You'll never heal the wounded. You cannot repair the damage already done by selfish parents, vicious ex-lovers, child molesters, tyrants, poverty, depression, or simple chemical imbalance. You can't undo psychic wounds. You can't bandage old scars. You can't kiss away ancient bruises. You can't make the pain go away. You cannot shout down the voices in other people's heads. You can't make anyone feel special. They'll never feel beautiful enough, no matter how beautiful they are to you. They will never feel loved enough, no matter how much you adore them. You will never be able to save the battered from battling back in a world that they've grown to hate. They'll always find a way to pick up where the bullies have left off. They will in turn become the bullies. They will turn you into the enemy. They will always find a new method in which to punish themselves, thereby punishing you. No matter how much you've convinced yourself that you have done absolutely everything in your power to prove your undying devotion, unfaltering commitment, and unending encouragement, you will never be able to save a miserable bastard from themselves. The wounded will always find a way to spread their pain over a vast terrain like an emotional tsunami which devastates the surrounding landscape, an ever-expanding firewall which will singe everything and everyone in its wake. The longer you love a damaged person, the more it will hurt you. They will mock your generosity, abuse your kindness, expect your forgiveness, try your patience, sap your energy, and eventually kill your soul. They will not be happy until you are as miserable as they are. Then their incredible self-loathing will be justified by the perpetuation of a cycle from which there is little recourse. Once you enter their free fall, it will be virtually impossible to turn your back on them. You will be racked with guilt, frustrated by your own impotence, and made furious forever buying into their bullshit in the first place. Now, of course, the more damaged, the more charismatic, the more brilliant, the more sexually intoxicating, the more dangerous to your own mental health, I'd say. Burroughs would say, Know he said it somewhere. He would say, I awoke from sickness, that is the sickness at the age of 45, calm and sane, and reasonably good health, except for a weakened liver and a look of borrowed flesh common to all who survive the sickness. Most survivors do not remember the delirium in detail. I apparently took detailed notes on sickness and delirium. I have no precise memory of writing the notes, which now have been published under the title Naked Lunch, whose title was suggested by Jack Kerouac. I did not understand what the title meant until my recent recovery. The title means exactly what the words say, Naked Lunch, a frozen moment when everyone sees what is at the end of every fork. The sickness is drug addiction, and I was an addict for 15 years. And when I say addict, I mean an addict to junk, a generic term for opium, and or the derivatives, including all synthetics from Demerol to Palfium. 
I have used chunk in many forms, morphine, heroin, Dilaudid, etc. I have smoked junk, eaten it, sniffed it, injected it in vein, skin, muscle, inserted it in rectal suppositories. The needle is not important. Whether you sniff it, smoke it, eat it, or shove it up your ass, the result is the same. Addiction. When I speak of drug addiction, I do not refer to keef, marijuana, or any preparations of hashish, mescaline, LSD6, sacred mushrooms, or any other drug of the hallucinogenic group. There is no evidence that the use of any hallucinogenic results in physical dependence. The action of these drugs is physiologically opposite to the action of drunk, of junk. A lamentable confusion between the two classes of drugs has arisen owing to the zeal of the U.S. and other narcotic departments. I've seen the exact manner in which the junk virus operates through 15 years of addiction. The pyramid of junk, one level eating the level below it. It is no accident that junk higher-ups are always fat and the attic on the street is always thin. Right up on the top or top, since there are many junk pyramids feeding on people of the world and all built on basic principles of monopoly. One, never give anything away for nothing. Two, never give more than you have to give. Always catch the buyer hungry and always make him wait. Three, always take everything back if you possibly can. The pusher always gets it all back. The attic needs more and more junk to maintain a human form. Buy off the monkey. I've never been a heroin addict. I've done heroin twice. I've done drugs since I was 12 years old. I've done second alls, two and alls, playludes, crassidils, placidils, cocaine, ecstasy, MDMA, mescaline, chocolate mescaline, uh, marijuana. Uh, am I leaving anything out? I was never an addict, um, although I still like drugs. But you notice Burroughs knew enough too that basically it's heroin and of course, prescribed medication, which is the most dangerous for people, I think, because it gets inside you in a way that nothing ever does. I think that drugs can be very beneficial when used correctly, but like anything, I mean, I think alcohol is far more dangerous than most drugs because it's uh, allowed everywhere, and certainly people are killed in America we, on every weekend from drunken drivers. Uh, I'm not supporting drugs, but what I was... I wish they supported me. And actually, I was supported by selling drugs at the age of 15 on the streets, 16 on the, age, on the streets of New York. Black Beauty, second house, plastics, quaaludes, two and I was never addicted to drugs. I was always addicted to energy. I was addicted to adrenal overload. I was addicted to, I wouldn't say I was a sex addict, but I was addicted to the energy of intimate communication. Uh, and I say this. I spent months, possibly years, comatose on hard benches, tracking the periphery of playgrounds, skulking through shopping malls, falling asleep in the library, trying to capture and trap a fleeting image. The image of a young boy at just the right moment in his life, that transient, fleeting second when an incandescent light falls on the hollows of his cheek, a splash of sunlight dances on his lips, and that blossom of purity etched deep within their innocent smile rebirths something in me that was lost a long time ago. There's something about how fine their bones are under their flesh. The possibility of shattering them under my need. Skin pulled tight around bony joints, the flattering reflection of my own beauty divorced of disease, my multiple sicknesses a withering away abated. Transformed into a healing tonic, a sexual salvation, a vacation from the devastation that has ringed the wellspring of my life. Not that I could ever forget how much my life has already been melted away, or how much I gave up or gave over or wasted, or how much has already been stolen or destroyed, or how many road burns have left their browning residue around my heartstrings, but let's face facts. You don't have to fight yourself too hard to fall in love at least for half an hour, 20 minutes, two days a week with a young boy who finds in you the love they never found in their own mother's arms and reciprocates it twofold. And I'll play mommy. I'm good at it. And there's nothing to lose. And what it is you gain is their life force, a transformation, a resurrection, a reckoning, a day off from playing wet nurse in the trauma unit, nursing damaged junkies back to health. But I'm too far gone now. I'm too fucked up, too ill spent to really carry through. <coughs> Shot to shit and forced to struggle against it, broken down, battered, used too much up. 
nothing left inside. My angel saving grace is that busted little cherub with dirty feet and greasy wings whose tender ruby rich kisses have resuscitated so many burning embers and dying remains that I have become like a mortician's reanimator, stuck forever in a purgatory that so many dying men have come to rub their poison against. Even my breath has become toxic, an aerosol taint of glue, sugar water, paint fumes, dead roses, and runoff. But young boys don't know that yet. They can't see it. They can't smell it over my true essence, over the sweat of their own passion, over the smell of their own vinegar, salt water, taffy, dirty towel, steam, heat. They wouldn't recognize it even if they did. They have no reference point, no landmarks, no track records, no wars below the belt. No idea what it's like to inhabit this fleshy prison of blood and bones as if entombed in an unnamed Nuremberg Cathedral which 40 years later still remains swept to the side of a blood-stained street, the bones of her confessional stacked helter-skelter shattered under the steel rods. The rebar of the enemy pilots who blew in one day with the taste of her death on their breath and in the wake, there she still stands, torn into little pieces, praying to be glued back together again and praying for resurrection, for redemption, praying with blind faith and stupid adoration to a cruel and vindictive God that does not exist, that one day the wounds will heal over, that a dark angel will tumble down from the heavens, your name on his lips, and with a single kiss, the multiple fractures where memory and madness commit soul murder will cauterize, will mend, will dissolve, but as with most prayers, I'm wasting my fucking <laughs> Let's see what he's got for a shower. <clears throat> oh, gentle reader, the ugliness of that spectacle buggers description. Who can be a cringing, pissing coward, yet vicious as a purple-ass mandrel, alternating these deplorable conditions like vaudeville skits? Who can shit on a fallen adversary who die and eats the shit and screams with joy? Who can hang a weak passive and catch a sperm in his mouth like a vicious dog? Oh, gentle reader, I fain would spare you this, but my pen hath its will like the ancient mariner. Oh, Christ, what a scene is this. Can tongue or pen accommodate these scandals? A beastly young hooligan has gouged out the eye of his confrere and fucked him in the brain. This brain atrophy already and dry as grandmother's cunt. He turns into rock and roll hoodlum. I screw the old gash like a crossword puzzle. What relation to me is the outcome if there is an outcome? My father already or not yet. I can't screw you, Jack. You was about to become my father, and better to cut your throat and screw my mother playing it straight than fuck my father or vice versa, mutatis mutandis, as the case may be, and cut my mother's throat. That sainted gash, though it be his best way I know to stem her word hoard and freeze her assets. I mean, when a fellow he caught short in the switches and don't know is he to cover up his ass to great big daddy or commit a torso job on the old lady? <clears throat> Give me two cunts and a prick of steel and keep your dirty finger out of my sugar bum. What do you think I am, a purple ass reception already fugitive from Gibraltar? Male and female castrated he them, who can't distinguish between the sexes. I'll cut your throat, you white motherfucker. Come out in the open like my grandchild and me, my unborn mother, in dubious battle. Confusion hath fuck his masterpiece. I've cut the janitor's throat quite by mistake of identity. He being such a horrible fuck like the old man. And in the coal bin, all cocks are alike. Now, this is Burroughs at his most abstract, which I love because it's hilarious and which ultimately is just a bunch of dirty thoughts strung together and cut up on a piece of paper and then glued together. But that's all good, isn't it? That's all good. Yeah. This is my addiction. I fell into his hollow, the vacuum in his eyes, that empty space inside where beyond his obvious pain, trauma, tragedy, a little boy had long ago been murdered, butchered, bludgeoned, massacred. Left abandoned on some shit-stained road marked not on any map but well-defined enough to read in Braille. And it was written all over Johnny. Dead end. Do not enter. End of the road. Called a sack. No outlet. Lost highway. I should have known better. I did know better. I just couldn't stop myself. You see, Johnny Bruce is a tender ache inside of me. 
even after an all-night bender when he comes swaggering back to my bunk, bent on an ugly kind of drunk, stinking on wild Irish rose, sporting another black eye and limping again. The way his face lights up when he knows I'm half awake, Ben waiting up, staring down the clock, sucking up caffeine and codeine, worried sick and swollen from not enough sleep and pissed off. Yeah, I'm fucking pissed off what took him so long, but I'm thrilled and I can't fake a cock on because I just want to kiss. And he gets to live another day, so I get to live another day, which is all the reason I need to forgive him, at least for now. Because I can't face the fucking fact that one day I may have to live without him. And that day may come sooner than either of us want to admit. But for today, for right now, which is all that matters, he wasn't set up and offed in some two-bit hustle. It didn't play Patsy to a sleazy pickup line whispered under the breath of a serial-killing <coughs> sex stalker. He didn't stumble into a speeding car before passing out and pissing all over himself. He didn't fall off a fire escape trying to jimmy open and pry out one of the frail old sex queens from a ratty roach infested bed set on fire in an opium haze by a lit cigarette dropped from the limp fist of some young trick he got dope dick and the drips off of which he almost did fall five stories that is from the roof of the shitbag hotel he night watches and he didn't even try to catch himself he didn't care he said he was ready to curse creation and kiss the concrete just to see how many bones would shatter and how bad it would feel when they did but his belt got looped around a broken rung and instead of wringing his neck it saved his ass and that was just last week if I was a soldier, I'd trip over a landmine, he'd laugh. Small belly chuckle eyes, not faking too hard on innocence. He still manages to maintain, and with all my might, try as I do, I just can't decode how. But the beauty is, Johnny doesn't get it either. He doesn't see it. He can't feel it. He's so busy dousing his wounds with Benedine, counting his scars, picking at scabs, another hairline fracture here, a small concussion there, bloody rags wrapped around the temple, soaking up the fallout from the body, his battlefield to be trampled under by his big black boots. Stormtroopers kicking the shit out of the enemy within, waging counteroffensives, which will guarantee mutually assured destruction, not only against himself, not only against me, but aimed directly at the shell-shocked and battle-fatigued little boy who screams for ceasefire in the bunker and wants his mommy to kamikaze in the demilitarized zone, that uncharted territory where a part of him still lives. The part that cowers in the far corner late at night, scared of shadows and holy ghosts, scared of lo losing life before figuring out exactly what it fucking means to be alive, and life is just an endless barrage of bullshit and petty disasters where losing whatever it is you're desperately trying to hold on to is not only natural, but almost genetically pre-programmed in. And Jesus Christ, I want to save him for himself. I want to take care of him. I want to mother him. I want to love him. I want to get him to love himself. I want to be saint savior and favorite sin, but we're both sick with need. We're sick on each other and not a single day goes by that I don't whisper a stupid prayer that smears God's name to keep him safe, but he's not fucking safe. He's not safe. He's not safe from me and I'm not safe from him. The pusher always gets it all back. The attic needs more and more junk to maintain a human form to buy off the monkey. Junk is the mold, monopoly, and, pos and possession. The attic stands by while his junk legs carry him straight in on the junk beam to relapse. Junk is quantitative and accurately measurable. The more junk you use, the less you have, and the more you have, the more you use. All the hallucinogenic drugs are considered sacred by those who use them. They are peyote cults and hashish cults and mushroom cults, the sacred mushrooms of Mexico and able a man to see God, but no one, no one has ever suggested that junk is sacred. There are no opium cults. 
opium is profane and quantitative like money. I've heard that there was once a beneficent, non-habit-forming junk in India. It was gold silva, and is pictured as a beautiful blue tide. If Soma ever existed, the pusher was there to bottle it and monopolize it and sell it and turn it into plain all-time junk. Junk is the ideal product, the ultimate merchandise. No sales talk necessary. The client will crawl through a sewer and beg to buy it. The junk merchant does not sell his product to the consumer. He sells the consumer to the product. He does not improve and simplify his merchandise. He degrades and simplifies the client. He pays his staff in junk. Junk yields a basic formula of evil versus the algebra of need. And I think this is Perot's most brilliant line, the algebra of need. He gets it here. Junk yields a basic formula of evil versus the algebra of need. The face of evil is always the face of total need. A dope fiend is a man in total need of dope. Beyond a certain frequency, need knows absolutely no limit or control. In the words of total need, wouldn't you? Yes, you would. You would lie, cheat, inform on your friends, steal, do anything to satisfy total need because you would be in a state of total sickness, total possession, and not in a position to act in any other way. Dope fiends are sick people who cannot act other than they do. A rabid dog cannot choose but to bite. Assuming a self-righteous position is nothing to the purpose unless your purpose be to keep the junk virus in operation. Yeah. Now, just because I was never an addict doesn't mean I haven't lived with addicts. Because I have. And as I said, they're always so fucking attractive and manipulative. Johnny could stubbornly avoid sleep for 46, 68, 72 hours at a time. Propelled by alcohol, speed, coke, adrenaline, or just sheer panic, he'd string himself so far out he could barely light a cigarette or raise a bottle. Trembling hands, massaging leg spasm. Chapped lips, cracked by pointy canines, x-ray eyes detecting invisible monsters who'd steal them from me as he night-stalked energy trails, failing stars, fading headlights, meteors, night birds, stray cats. He'd have a flashlight cocked to his hip, a butcher knife in the torn back pocket. He'd be sneak peeping around corners, frozen in door frames. He'd be glued to the windowsill, peeking through a cigarette burn in the fabric. He'd be paralyzed at the foot of the stairs. Paranoid agitation strangled the hours. It fueled his psychosis. It bored the shit out of me, forcing me into silence. He'd attempted to code the flow of traffic two blocks away, the scampering of rats in the next building, an anthill under construction in the backyard. It was like he was on an insane reconnaissance mission. The enemy, the sonic surround. Every creaky floorboard, rattling pipe, electrical hum, it was like a forged television static, which seemed to leak from his ears out filling the room with a reverberating symphony of sub-decibel tones only he could hear. It was like a swelling claustrophobia. The cold sweat on his brow expanded like a freak weather pattern which coated the room in a dense fog of atmospheric perspiration. And sex became impossible. Johnny just couldn't focus. I'd be curled around him, one leg snaked high up on his hips, wiggling against him, and he'd be teasing me with cool fingers, tickling my inner thighs, whispering about the texture of my flesh and how its plump satin was as sweet as honeyed butter, and to be suffocating there was to be buried alive, inhaling my heat. It was heaven, the only place he felt safe, the only place he felt home. I'd cry for him to take me, to give me more, to feed it to me. Just give me more. Now I was addicted. Finish me off. Do something, anything more, please. Now, goddammit. And then a car door would slam halfway up the block. He'd jump out of bed, mute the stereo, turn off the lights, run to the window. Jimmy would open a crack to get a better look. He'd weave like a punch-drunk boxer attempting to spy a crack in the darkness through which he could narrow his vision in order to locate the intruder. He'd go through this routine six or seven times a night, 
sentry at his post for countless hours, waiting for the imaginary invader to materialize, forever convinced that whoever was out to get him, for whatever reason, was sure to eventually appear, pull up right in front of my apartment, kick the goddamn door in, and take him away. No amount of practical reasoning would sway his dedication to this bizarre night watch. I assumed it was a hangover from digging the graveyard shift at the shitty hotel he used to work at. Try to convince him of that. He wouldn't hear it. Eventually, I grow bored, begin to fume, leave the room, frustrated, pissed off, dejected, horny. His paranoia, his paranoia began to batter my resolve. The end whimpered in like a small, sick breeze one spring night. We were lying on the couch, softly purring into each other's mouth. So worked up and wet, the cushions were sticky. It was on top of me, his beautiful face inches away from mine, eyes half closed, lips parted just enough for the tip of his tongue to taste my breath. I blew in his mouth. He inhaled a whisper of moist heat, blew it back at me, light kiss, bliss, dreamscape, dissolve, and the sound of small claws scampering on the roof. Must be the raccoons in heat. Such was the season. Johnny bolted off of me, wild-eyed, panicked, pulling out his hair, his eyebrows, his, pulling at his lips, muttering, I knew those fuckers would come back. Bastards! Where's the knife? Where's the fucking buck knife? Hurry up and get the buck knife! What? What? Bastards. Who's come back? Bewildered, drained, I, I, I was ready to give up. The assholes have been taping me. I knew they were taping our conversations. I saw them in a black van last week. Cameras, tape recorders, parked out front. They're back, and now they're on the roof. Shit! They are not on the goddamn roof. Get a fucking grip on yourself, Johnny. It's probably just a fucking raccoon. We had been through this before. A week earlier, and the week before that, and the week before that. Four in the morning. I forced him out of bed and led him by the hand to stand across the street from the apartment, arguing for two and a half hours about the construction of the roof. I was unable to assure him that it was slanted to such a degree that no human being, except for Spider-Man, had the dexterity to dance, walk, run, or climb upon its slanted gables. He was not convinced. Yeah, well, raccoons don't sit in vans shoving a microphone out the side of the window, do they? Do they? What the hell are you talking about? Shh, shh. Did you hear that? Yeah, I do. And if it was fucking human and it heard us making a freaking racket, don't you think they just got damn split, jump off the roof, be out of here? I'm calling the cops. No, you are not calling the cops. Are you fucking nuts? There's drugs all over the house. They'll take one look at you and call for an ambulance. Where's the phone? Where's the goddamn phone? Johnny flipped the pillows off the couch, turned the chairs over, knocked the TV off the shelf, checked his back pocket, my purse, and searched the phone, finding it finally where it always was, on the kitchen counter, and stupidly dialing 911. I snatched the phone away to hang up, calling him a fucking asshole. It rings in my hand. He grabs it back, conspiratorially whispering to the operator, who by law will respect penal code section 13730 and dispatch a fucking Scott squad car immediately. It's you, isn't it? Isn't it? The guy in the black van. I knew it was you. I knew it. Yeah. Now that's. and I, besides the fact that I've written more good pages than he has, according to me, is he still and I'm not. He did live to be 84. I, I fear that might happen to me as well. Um, heroin preserves a lot of people. People can be heroin addicts for decades, but very few can be functional heroin addicts. And the only reason he was what was considered a functional heroin addict, basically, was because he had his parents to pay for his habit. As he, as he put it, uh, he was able to collect $200 a month, which is about what, probably 2000 in th this day and age, to look at his shoe for eight hours a day in a shitty room in Tangier where he did not change his clothes for one year. As he said, they're stinking and old queer looking for young boys now if only we all had that luxury because of our parents. Instead, you just get to come here and hear about it, but thank you for coming. Any questions? Hello. Um, I reckon you have read uh, Carolyn Cassidy's book. Course I haven't read Carolyn Cassidy's book. Do you recommend it? Yeah, it's a great book. It's about the, the beat generation. She has a totally different view of the general myth. Great, because she was there as a woman. Yeah, she was there. She's still alive. How old is she now? 
70s? She just died. She just died. Exactly. Okay. Was that all she wrote? Was this one book, or did yeah. she write? As, was she like D Diana De Primo wrote a lot at that same period? There were other women writing. They don't get much attention. What was her book called? Carolyn off Cassidy. The, off the road. Off the road. So it was written by uh, Jack Kerouac's uh, John Neil, Neil, Neil Cassidy's, Cassidy's wife. For, for thirty years. Did she have an affair with Kerouac as well? Yes. Of course. We would have <laughs> been very liberated in those days. Off the road. Thank you. Hi. Yeah, why not? Uh, just, Can mean, you stand up and speak just, loudly? Certainly. Uh, <coughs> this may be an article of common knowledge. I thought you were courageous, and of course, Burroughs was the most influential writer you should as I was becoming human. Um, but uh, your surname as it were, adopted from? Uh, yeah, thank you very much. It's not taken from his book. Thank you for asking. Uh, I ran away to New York at 14 for a short time, influenced by the New York Dolls and wanted to be a performer. And then I went back, got money, and came to New York at the age of 16, 17. And some of my first friends in New York were the group Suicide and the group Mink DeVille. And we were all really, really poor. So uh, I took a job for two weeks probably the only the second job and never again if I had one. So I could work at a bar and steal food for Mink DeVille. And one day I'm walking down the street to their rehearsal space with the stolen booty of goodies. I hadn't performed yet except for one acid party in Rochester in Buffalo, New York at the age of 14. I was plotting to perform and Willie DeVille just plops out, Lydia Lunch, and it was like glue. I couldn't get rid of it. I mean, I just, so it had, I had not performed anything yet except for Deviant Sex Sex with the group Mink DeVille. But um, I had not done public performances, and so hence then that, I, that was just stuck. I couldn't get rid of it. It was just Lydia Lunch. And in a way, I mean, I, I think that what I do with writing is to feed the soul of people anyway, so I didn't choose it. The favorite part about my name is once I called Russ Meyer, the filmmaker, to get an in to interview him. A friend of mine, Lance Loud, had interviewed him, and I called him. He didn't know who I was, but he said, let me launch, it's the greatest name in showbiz. I thought he must think I'm a porno star, so I'm like, all right, I like the name. He didn't know who I was. That's why I got the name Lunch. And I wrote a cookbook last year called The Need to Feed. It's very sexy and sassy, you can get it on Amazon. It's, and it's got musical suggestions. And the reason I wrote that is uh, True Blood, do you know True Blood, the, the TV show? Um, well, Marianne, the, the witch, who was always cooking food and, and drugging people for these wild, Bacchanalian orgies said she based her character on me. Yeah, and he, Ken Russell, I'm like, well, I should write a cookbook, The Need to Feed, and I did, but nobody ever put the two and two together. Yeah. People are so dumb. I've been wondering, you've been working with Henry Rollins. Uh, when was that, and what, what did you bring Yeah, I, okay, so um, when I first went to New York, I wanted to do spoken word, but spoken word, which I don't know if I turned or who turned it, didn't exist. It was post beat poetry, it was post Patti Smith rock and roll poetry, it was pre, early, before performance art, there was performance art, but there was no slam poetry. But at the same time, not only, uh, there were a few people, and not only me, but there was Rollins and Exine Surbank and Jello Biafra, who for some reason all at the same time started, and I was in LA and went to see a performance by Rollins, and this was when he was very hardcore spoken word, I mean terrifying, and I'm just like, this is, this is the guy for me to go on tour with. This I was pretty fucking terrifying, although my stuff was even more macho than his, so that was interesting. And um, so I just said hi to Lydia Lunch, and we started doing shows together. And he didn't know who Hubert Selby was, and then he, he's, he's a little bit younger than I am. But uh, I said, why don't we go meet Hubert Selby, who was my literary hero. So we sought him out, and we, I don't know if we called him or just knocked on his door. Because this was before the film Requiem for a Dream had come out, and basically for many years, Hubert Selby, a very important American writer, um, was just nobody cared about him. You know, I mean, his books were banned originally. Grove Press put them out, but nobody really. The French cared about Selby, and the British cared about Hubert Selby. And I don't know if we called him or knocked on his door, but we invited him to do readings with us and toured with Hubert Selby in Europe. And I toured on and off with Henry Rollins. This is the early mid '80s and with Hubert Selby, and then Don Byam and other people in Europe as well. Um, and Hubert Selby had never been paid. Readers are not usually paid to read. I, I also, and the people aforementioned, we kind of insisted if you're going to read, you're going to fucking get paid. But if you write a book and you go to bookstores, you don't get paid for that shit. So I actually got quite a few people paid 
to do readings by just putting it in a different environment. Um, it was when I approached Hubert Selby, I said, "Do you have any idea how important you were to my you are to my generation?" He's like, "No, I really don't." <laughs> I'm here to tell you. And then um, he wrote the introduction for my book Paradoxia. I have a few copies of books, but they're in French. I don't have any English ones because I know you're English, but I'm American, but I can't carry their shit around. These are just leftovers. If anybody wants to buy a few copies of it. Um, but I worked with a lot of uh, spoken word artists. Also, Wanda Coleman, who is an African American uh, professor who came out of the Watts riot and the Alaska poet scene. And I recorded a record, I re did a lot of live shows with her and produced an album by her. And um, spoken word was what I went to New York to do. But, but I, I, started, I had to start with music because it just didn't exist yet. So, But consequently, I've also booked a lot of, I curated a lot of series, and I, I've gotten many people to the stage for the first time. Um, not Henry Rollins, he was already, Nick Cave did his first spoken word reading because I asked him, Vincent Gallo, the actor is first and only, Ken Stringfellow of the Posies, um, Bibby Hansen, who is Beck's mother and the daughter of Elle Hansen, Fluxus artist, I got her to do her first reading and, and hence, in the, in the 10 years since she's written her memoirs. I hosted in Los Angeles a series of performances called The Unhappy Hour, which was Sunday from like 6 to 8. And just to get people up there to do even 10 minute performances and, and based preferably on their real life and on their experience, because that's to me what's very important. I mean, creative writing is great, but the, my thing is real stories told by real people, for people who can relate to this stuff. Uh, one of my favorite performances that I ever did, it was that the Knitting Factory in LA was doing a Beat Generation Week, and they called me to, to curate something, and I'm like, look, I'm anti-Beat. Not that I was anti-Beat, but I'm like, Selby wasn't really into the beats. I'm into Selby in that, as I said before, Miller's and et cetera. I said, I'll do an anti-beat beat night. So um, Selby agreed, and this great uh, LA writer called Steve Abu wrote a great book called On the Bus. And somebody had suggested to me to contact Harry Dean Stanton. Now, if anybody's seen Paris, Texas, he has one of the greatest monologues in film history in Paris, Texas, which takes place in a peep booth. So Harry Dean Stanton, of course, doesn't know who I am, but he was performing a lot at this place, The Mint. So I, I'm just going to call him. My friends would call him, tell him I took. So I'm inviting him to do this performance. I, and I had to, had to describe myself. I'm like, well, I'm kind of like Bukowski, but more physical. He's like, oh, that sounds good. All right, I'll do it. So I have two 72-year-old men. I must be, I maybe I'm 40 at the time. I have two 70-year-old, two 72-year-old men. Um, Harry Dean Stanton doesn't know he Hubert self. He has, even though Requiem for a Dream had already come out. So, um, Hubert Selby was sober for 40 years. Harry Dean Stanton sober for 40 minutes. This, as the sandwich meat of this performance, was one of the <coughs> highlights of my life. I'm just like, out oh, of this is great. Because basically, I feel like I am a dirty old man. And I will eventually stage a performance called Dirty Old Men, where I'm reading all my favorite passages of the dirty old white men, most of them dead. I figure I support a lot of living white men. The dead men can start to support me. That's why I'm here tonight. Burroughs, it's the 100th year anniversary of his birth. Thanks, Pops. <laughs> Questions or answers or suggestions? Lydia, tell us what the, what's your uh, favorite book that you've written that you would recommend someone that hasn't written? Uh, Thank you very much. Maybe my next one. Thank you very much. Well, well I, I mean, I haven't written that many books. I have a book of poetry. I wrote some comic books. I have two main books, both in French and English, not here tonight, only in French, and Paradoxia. Um, this label creation books have been pending me for many years to write a book, and I'm like, if you can give me an advance so that I can take enough time to write a book, I will. And um, since I don't like novels, I, I was really, because I'm used to writing speeches or spoken word. I mean, that's, I've written hundreds of, of texts for spoken word. Uh, I had a book called Incriminating Evidence, which was il illustrated with illustrations of, with various speeches and stuff in some of my plays. <coughs> but Paradoxia, a, 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 a small book company said, okay, you know, we have some money, so Paradoxia is a book, it has nothing to do with my creative life, it has to do with my sexual landscape and what really, uh, it's called the it's Paradoxia of Redditor's Diary. And I think it's very, to me, reading the books I read at 12, to 14, including up to Desaad. What was very important to me is, you can read Violet Leduc, and you can read Anais Nin, and you can read various other women writers, but there was some 
brutality missing in them, which my experience as a traumatized, as a victim of, of familial trauma, never addressed. And being someone who feels so completely sexually divided, female, female, that the voice I needed to hear didn't exist. And so I, I and, and I knew since the age of 12, I had to write, I had to define my existence because other people have a similar existence. I never felt I was alone in the traumas I faced, whether they were physical, emotional, familial, poverty, etc. Um, I never felt like, uh, people say, well, first of all, with paradoxy, it's very hardcore. And it's about the sexual landscape as a predator getting over her own trauma, stomping through many cities, and basically fucking like men fuck. And I don't mean you guys, because I know you're all soft and romantic. <laughs> whatever. whatever it takes. I know generation will listen all that. Um, but Paradoxy is the book I feel I had to write, because it speaks to a certain type of female predation that is never really talked about, and a certain need, because basically the algebra of need, it's about <coughs> consuming everything, that you're just going after with, with great abandon, uh, everything you want sexually. And I mean, when you're a hot 18-year-old chick, and you go up to somebody <coughs> and say, you want to fuck, basically they're going to fuck you, but they don't realize it's not the fucking that was important to me. It was the energy. It was the exchange. It was the intimacy. And yeah, the fucking was good too. Beside the point. That was my drug. My drug was the power to do it and to throw it away. To consume it and then, and not throw it away like to disregard, but to act like a man. Because, and the opening line is so twisted by men and man my father that I became like one. But in the end there is a moral. And the moral of, of the story is this, is that gluttony in any form, and this is especially important to women, because we can forever feel highly unsatisfied, because we're taught that lie as children, that Mr. Perfect is fucking out there, and you got one soulmate, and why don't you marry him? Well, why don't you bore yourself to fucking tears, honey? <coughs> Let's hope there's more, there are more than one soulmate for every one of us. I mean, look, sometimes there's six at a time, trust me on this. <laughs> I can assure you, that works well for some people at some times. But I think it's an important book because it, it not only, without any guilt or shame, which I never had, tells you in great detail about my gluttony, but also in the end, how the only thing that is going to fill you is yourself. And that I had to go through a period of complete detoxification from myself and my own urges because they were not easy to satisfy, but I could just get whatever I wanted because it was there and I was going to fucking take it. And in the end, you can gluttonize the same way you can get junk sick and the same way Burroughs had to take a cure. I had to find a way to cure myself and that was to realize, first of all, I was running toward death because I had no fear. Meaning I wanted life to be as extreme as possible because I couldn't feel anything else. So I had to try to come to grips with that and realize that death, man, it's for fucking ever. See, turtles live long. And death, like a lover who always promises you something but comes up short in the pants, honey, I mean, it will get here soon enough, as my fate will probably, probably come too soon. So, uh, that book is pretty important, I think. Because in the end, you have to, especially women, satisfy yourself. And you have to know what you fucking want, or you're not going to get it. You can't be mamby-pamby here. You can't be wishy-washy. And I think that any, there is no taboo. Whatever your obsession is, if you find a consenting person, and they're out there, it might take you decades to find them, but whatever obsession or deep desire that you really need to get satisfied, don't give up on the hopes that you will get that satisfied. It just may take you a while to find the perfect partner for that. And no shame and no guilt. And get over feeling intimidated about your fucking body. Because you know what? Men think you're fucking hot anyway. Believe me. They're not looking as closely as you are. Yeah. Every slight imperfection in you, delicacy, ladies, you're lovely. Yeah. Paradoxia. Only in French, though. You, know, you can get it online. Buy it used or steal it. It's one of the most stolen books. <laughs> you steal one of these, I'll kill you. I'm sure it's better. Of course. Yeah, yeah. What are you guys all doing here? I'm glad that there's a bunch of guys in the back. What are you getting from this? What are you getting from this? What are you I grew up on No Wave, man. What? I grew up on No Wave. All right! <laughs> no Wave is a state of fucking mind, dude. Excellent. What does No Wave mean to you? Uh, well, you know, I grew up listening to the Beatles or the Who or whatever, and uh, I, by chance, met some fellow who, like, 
said, okay, listen to Pavement, listen to Dear Hunter, listen to Sonic Youth, and Sonic Youth worked. Uh, then I started, I was playing drums, and then he kicked me out of the shitty band we were in, and then I uh, picked up a guitar and started playing noise with a fellow called Jim McCauley, and we like the sort of stream of consciousness, uh, lo-fi, uh, uh, thing, we just made uh, in yeah, LA? High school worth it, yeah. Yeah. Okay. Go on. I don't know, that's... that's oh, that's cool. Yeah. That's great. That's why you're here. No Wave is a state of mind, as well as a state of music that only a few people finally get. Thank you for getting it. Anyone else just want to say anything? You can f feel free. I mean, this is just about language, talking. Language is a virus. If you want to spread any of your own personal contamination, feel free. Otherwise, I'm going to go outside, have a cigarette, and then I'm going to have a fucking drink. You can join me on that. Hey, Lydia. Hi. You have two really good bands going on. Oh, I have four Three. bands right now. Yeah. What's, you know, what's up? You're, you're yeah, let me tell you what's up now, kids. Golden period. Because <laughs> I'm in the, those golden years. Yeah, right. Well, some bitch has got to get up there and rock it hard. I mean, somebody's got to do cock rock, right? And that would be me. So, yeah, I, I have a few. I have a band called Big Sexy Noise, which is just, I like to call it cock rock, because there's not many women just doing hard rock now. Uh, big Sexy Noise, that, that, that's guys from the band Yell and Drunk. And then James Johnson, who also played with Nick Cave. I have a group called Medusa's Bed, which is a, uh, a three-piece women, <coughs> yeah, one uh, Palestinian sound artist, a Austrian avant violinist, and myself. And it's like, it's like psycho-ambient radio drama. We, we will be touring in Austria in November. Uh, my album with Cypress Grove just came out, and Cypress Grove was the last person to tour with Jeffrey Lee Pierce of the Gun Club, if any of you know who the Gun Club was. You do, you're from LA. And Cypress Grove released three, soon to be four, tribute records to Jeffrey Lee Pierce, and that's how I became familiar with him, is he asked me to do some tracks uh, on his tribute record, and now we've just released an album called Fistful of Desert Blues, very sexy desert blues music. Um, and then there's Retrovirus. And that's what's exciting to me, and I hope to bring around this area soon in February or March. And Retrovirus, um, I was, uh, so I wrote an introduction for the t-shirt book called Ripped, and it was about DIY t-shirts. I don't wear t-shirts, I just don't, but I, you know, their t-shirts are cool. So I wrote the introduction, and the Los Angeles School of Design wanted to stage the exhibition of my friend's book. So he wanted to bring Big Sexy Noise, work papers took too long, I had to form a band, and I decided with Bob Bird of Sonic Youth, one of my oldest friends, I've known Bob Bird for over 30 years, he's one of the original drummers for Sonic Youth. I'm like, Bob, why don't we get something together? He's like, yeah, about time. Bob Bird has seen more of my shows than any living man should. And so I thought Retrovirus, good name. And originally it was with Algis Kizzy, who was in Swans, and then Weasel Walter, who's one of the most genius avant improvisers on drum and guitar and is a no-wave expert since he was 14 in all things Lydian, volunteered, and so Retrovirus formed. Now we have a new bass player, Tim Dahl, but we've toured Europe and we've released uh, you know, a live record, and it's a retrospective, so it, it flavors, my, it, it fl flavors, savors, and tastes, and then throws back at the public my musical schizophrenia from Teenage Jesus, Eight Night Spy, Queen of Siam, 1313, Shotgun Wedding, which was a band with Roland Howard at the birthday party, and as much as we can put into an hour and ten minute set, and it's a lot of fun. A lot of this music was never played live. What's interesting to me is to see because I consider myself no wave, no matter what form of music I do. I consider no wave, and I will define no wave for those of you who don't know what it is. Uh, no wave, when you hear the term punk or jazz, not jazz, punk, country, blues, you know what that sounds like. But when you hear no wave, you might not know what it sounds like because none of it sounds alike. It's dissident, it's not audience friendly necessarily, it's hardly melodic, occasionally it is like the contortions. It's a period uh, of music that started in New York that basically went from 77 to 79 and that included very few groups, but that consequently has had a big impact on noise artists and just anyone that wants to be, that push the tradition of, of rock music. Any, anyone who thinks rock music is just too traditional or not enough wants to do something uh, highly irritating is probably in no way, no way it can be very irritating. That's, why my sets with Teenage Jesus were seven minutes to 13 minutes long. I felt less is more. So Retrovirus is fun because it's exposing the music to people that weren't even born when I wrote most of it. And, um, and it's, it's good, raunchy, rocking insanity. Rah, rah, rah. We'll be here in March, February, March.
sorry, I don't need a monopoly. But you can do whatever you want. I love a monopoly. This is, I, I actually have a somewhat, a somewhat serious question about um, ethics and self-representation. <coughs> I've been a passionate defender of <coughs> work against friends of mine who have criticized it often for being essentially a, uh, especially paradoxia, what amounts to a handbook for miscreants. Bah! And What's wrong with that? Well, like, well exactly. That's my, that's my question. I mean, there's, there's, there's... Well, look, I can, I would have, I'm going to cut you off. What's great, thank you for defending it. You can't criticize my fucking life. All right, you can, but I don't give a shit. So you friends that want to criticize reality on somebody that has the balls to tell it with no glamour and no romance and they can't see the poetry, that's their fucking problem. You know, believe me, I have been hated in more ways than you can think of. And it only, if you, because I don't, you, I would rather be hated for the right reasons than loved for the wrong reasons. But preferably, I would rather be loved by those that need to hear a voice that speaks to something in their soul that nobody else can fucking hit. And that's why I do what I do. And you know what, I have never been insulted in my life once because an insult does not penetrate me. It just doesn't. Because I know I'm right in doing what I'm doing, which is to tell the truth about a certain style and way of life and manner of thinking that other people do relate to and that doesn't have many voices, especially female, speaking for them. My job is to speak about the universal traumas and how you not only survive them, but thrive them. So anybody, bring your fucking hatred, friends, and thank you for standing up for me. I wish you, I'm going to write a handbook for mystery. I'm going to write a handbook for deviants. You think my life is deviant? It has been banned in Russia. I'm surprised it hasn't been banned anywhere else. But it's real life. I'm not, this isn't fiction. So if my, it's like my film Fingered, that is a pretty controversial film, was... But then eventually the Whitney Museum in New York used it as their main film of New York Underground. It's been considered a uh, misogynist or a feminist classic. But basically I was trying to make a film that represented the horrors of some of my life. And basically how a victim will become the victimizer. And, and based on drive-in exploitation trailers. And you know that went from being like a frat beer party favorite to a, a feminist manifesto, to the most misogynist film ever made, and that ever, look, I didn't make it to be shocking, and when I saw this film, I, I was quite disappointed, I'm like, this is not hard enough. Because it may be hard to some of you lily-livered little, you know, wimps, for 20 minutes, it was my life for 30 fucking years, live it. So, you know, your little so-called friends, bring their insults, and thank you for defending me. But my life does it, I, I like that. Yeah, guys, if you haven't seen Fingered, don't. It's too early. It's not pretty. It's not pornography because the goal of pornography, what's separate? I'm just going to ask myself a question. Wow, Lydia, aren't those books, isn't that book and aren't those books kind of pornographic? I'll tell you why I am not a pornographer. Not that I'm against it. I think there needs to be more good pornography because there's tons of shit out there. Is pornography has two goals to get you off and to make money. Most of my work frustrates people. That they frustrates the people who don't get it. And it gives great relief to those that do get it. And I've never made any fucking money, so I must be in the wrong line of work here. <laughs> uh, plus, I'm just telling my version of my life. So if that seems pornographic to you, trust me, I'm sure it's a nightmare or something. That's fine. But to others, they're gonna find so they're gonna find the truth in there that's gonna, I hope, which is why I still do it, that will be like what art should be. The, the, the salve on the universal wound. You know, and that's why I've never, that's why to me, this is the perfect size to perform in front of me. Because I want to intimately give you the intimate stories of my life, whether it's musically or, or in literature. To me, I have a salon mentality. And I feel more of a surrealist and a Dadaist, which I said, what thing, what no way was descended from. So thank you all for coming here. Who would like? I drink or a snack, should we get out of here? <laughs> Thank you. <laughs>